Hey folks, welcome back. Thank you again for joining us on this journey into Purpose Work Nation, uh, this video book conversation. Um, I had a buddy yesterday call it a uh, the, the director's cut. I'm like, yeah, I kind of like that. It does kind of feel like a director's cut. Uh, as mentioned, this first half of the book is more like laying down historical and philosophical context, and the back half is more practical, like what leaders can actually do. So um, before we dive into chapter two, which is called The Bison Way, we're going to obviously explore the ethics of the bison. I want to uh, do my check-in to presence, kind of whole person activation. Um, yeah, and, and to welcome you to do the same thing. So we're going to do that same pies check-in. So physically feeling good, a little groggy, a little tired. I ate a whole pizza last night. I might have had something to do with it. <laughs> Um, also, all this hot yoga like dries out my eyes, so I'm constantly rubbing them, trying to get the sleep out of it. Uh, intellectual. I read a good essay this morning in this book I talked about before by F.J. Turner on the frontier in American history, suggesting that as we uh, colonized slash settled the West, the, the values of the United States began to form in yet kind of each successive, successive move westwards. Um, and that's kind of like piqued my interest. Like, hmm, that makes a lot of sense. Especially here in California. As, you know, we created Hollywood out of whole cloth. Um, you know, Silicon Valley, although a lot of support from D.C. in the 70s and 80s. But yeah, Kind of after the land frontier was developed, we went after culture. <laughs> we created that whole thing and then created the internet. This very thing that we're doing right now. Um, yes, University of Illinois had, my alma mater had some role in that, but uh, developing the IT infrastructure that now almost the entire world depends on. Um, I, I remember doing some research once. It was something like, well, I didn't do the research. Read the research. Let's be clear. I'm not a PhD researcher. Uh, that something like 80% of the world's uh, patents come out of the United States and something like 60% of those come out of California. Um, so yeah, just kind of in this kind of inquiry of what, is it, what does the West mean from a values perspective, from pioneering creativity, all that? Emotionally, present to a, a good deal of shame. Uh, there's been something sticking in my craw uh, from the first video that we did, and I'll, I'll unpack that more here in a second. Let's see, spiritually, yeah, feeling connected. Um, there are two related things that I'm privy to slash collaborating on, working on, and uh, feel like this is a very germinal moment for humanity in the United States. Like, a lot of big revisionings are happening, and I'm connected to a couple of them, and yeah, feeling, feeling like spiritually excited, in a sense, like the divine is moving through to re-envision every aspect of the human experience. Um, yeah, what else do I want to share? Uh, well, as you know, in the uh, in the description, you can find all sorts of ways to take this work more deeply. You can do, you can activate your purpose, uh, and meaning, and belonging at work. Book me for a workshop, speaker, all that good stuff. So. I want to swing back to this thing that's triggering some shame for me. Um, so I went off script, off prompter on the first one and talked about how I judged the decision to leave the United States as cowardly for myself and ostensibly for anyone else who chooses that. And it's just been sitting with me over the last few days like, well, you know, Brandon, like, who are you to say that? You know, you're a 6'2 white guy who's well networked well-resourced, physically intimidating, or can be, 
easy for you to say, oh, just like, you know, stick it out. I'm not a woman. I don't have daughters. I'm not afraid for their life. Um, I'm, I'm not in a place that is uh, in the middle of a climate catastrophe. That's like San Diego's not on fire. It's not flooded, you know, like Kentucky or lots of places throughout the American West. So I just want to say that uh, I, I'm softening my language, like retracting that cowardice thing, because if I had a daughter, I might think a little differently, especially if I have the opportunity to move to a country that protected women's, women's rights uh, more strongly than we do here, and where there's, uh, yeah, if there's food and water and safety, like, those come first. Those come before nation, I think, in a lot of ways. So just want to say sorry if that offended you. And also, uh, it's much more complex than I initially let on. So let's dive into chapter two, The Bison Way. First, of course, is a, a quote by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. from 1963. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all people are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. So why I chose this quote to open this chapter is that King is pointing to the end, you know, what, what he's calling like the end of uh, the civil rights movement. And that's that mountaintop, or what he would also describe as beloved community. You know, kind of how we talked about earlier, that, that unum ex fiat pluribus, that when we love each other as much as ourselves. And it also bears, it should also be mentioned that this quote has been weaponized against equality. And of course, we're not using that in that sense. We're not saying that we're colorblind and race doesn't matter. We're saying that racialized identity has created all these terrible outcomes and that the dream is that when our identities are no longer racialized where we can be seen for the beauty and dignity of our souls our, our souls craft our purpose our virtues our unique contributions and and the way that we add to the culture the the rich weave of the united states While today we find these words inspiring, at the time of their utterance, they provoked serious resistance and eventually resulted in the murder of Dr. King and many of his contemporaries. In this chapter, we'll look at the deeper theme underlying our resistance to racial and class solidarity and consider how to actualize our national purpose more broadly. Every nation has a dream, a code, a unifying myth that evokes its origins and holds its culture, society, and economy together. The same is true of organizations. As such, if we were to fulfill our purpose as a nation and understand the role that organizations have in fulfilling it, then we'll have to surface the underlying myth that has driven our nation for centuries and Western civilization since at least the beginning of the Roman Empire in 27 BCE. With a sober grasp of this myth, we can evoke a new one. We'll do just that by offering another myth that is older, yet more indigenous, inclusive, inspiring, prosperous, and expressive of our stated purpose and Dr. King's beloved community. As we explored in the last chapter, the history and socioeconomics of our nation are markedly different from Dr. King's dream. The myth that guides our nation is that of the rugged individualist, and typically a white man. He overcame the odds through wit, guile, creativity, and determination. He made a name for himself, became wealthy, and fulfilled his destiny. 
The heroes of our myth are men like Elon Musk, Tom Brady, Thomas Edison, Andrew Carnegie, Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, and John Rockefeller. We praise men like these, the resource extractor, the champion, the inventor, the investor, the technology disruptor. I believe this myth is best represented by our national bird, the bald eagle, which was selected after an intense debate by our founders. It makes sense to inquire as to why a solitary bird of prey, who swoops down from on high, who hunts, steals, extracts, and retreats to its perch to savor the feast, was selected to express the spirit of our nation versus a social herd animal. Perhaps on some unconscious level, it was selected for its colors, a golden beak with white feathers on top and brown feathers on the bottom, much like the distribution of power and wealth at home and what would guide our foreign policy. This is from Benjamin Franklin. For my own part, I wish the bald eagle had not been chosen the representative of our country. He is a bird of bad moral character. He does not get his living honestly. You may have seen him perched on some dead tree near the river, where, too lazy to fish for himself, he watches the labor of the fishing hawk. And when that diligent bird has at length taken a fish and is, and is bearing to its nest for the support of his mate and young ones, the bald eagle pursues him and takes it from him. With all the injustice, with all this injustice, he is never in good case, but like those among men who live by sharping and robbing, he is generally poor and often very lousy. Besides, he is a rank coward. The little kingbird, not bigger than a sparrow, attacks him boldly and drives him out of the district. He is therefore no means a proper emblem for the brave and honest. End quote. This is not to take anything away from the bird of prey, which is an integral part of numerous ecosystems and plays an important role in regulating fish populations and distributing nutrients from lakes and rivers to the forests. It is about how the as yet unacknowledged mythos of the bald eagle is driving our nation's culture and economy. It's about the symbolic nature of dominating others, using our sharp elbows and leveraging every advantage to improve our circumstances while minimizing our responsibility, expense, connection, and risk. Warning, this is another course of bitter medicine. The eagle is a symbol chosen by many nations, like Rome, Iraq, Russia, Poland, Syria, Mexico, and the Czech Republic. The Nazis were also big fans. This eagle mythos underpinned Roman law, the doctrine of discovery, and Calvinism, all of which crossed the ocean to the New World. It is the unspoken purpose of the Mayflower Compact and the Massachusetts Bay Colony, establishing white settler colonialists as God's chosen and divine ones, whose manifest destiny was to convert, subjugate, and or kill all others. The myth of the eagle informed our approach towards First Nations people, who we regarded as a foreign enemy, the devil, dark, lusty, lazy, and sinful. As punishment for their inconvenient existence, the, Mass the Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Virginia colonies began a state-sanctioned, privatized, and total war by providing incentives to white settlers to burn native villages and feed stores and receive bounties in return for the scalps taken from native men, women, and children. These first settler colonialists did not come over from Europe on the heels of an abundant, healthy, soulful, and connected upbringing, but rather after having been oppressed, dehumanized, and exploited for centuries by eagle doctrines in their home countries. It is no wonder that the cross, crown, and reason, and the golden rule were extended only to other white Christians, and, then, and even then selectively. The gun and hatchet were for everyone else especially if they had something we wanted. As we explored, the eagle myth shaped our colonial expansion, our slavery-based economy, our relationships to one another at home, and our foreign policy. It also turned its talons upon Christianity itself. In the early 1900s, via the Second Great Awakening, 
Christianity morphed into an evangelical individualism. It was no longer about God's chosen white people seeking refuge in white Jesus and the white community. It was now every white person for themselves. Ministers like Charles Finney and Oral Roberts put the path to wealth and divinity in our hands, laying the foundation for the prosperity gospel in Reverend Ike's Fake It Till You Make It in black communities and Pat Robertson's Tele-Evangelism in white communities. While paying lip service to divine providence, this gospel focused on the individual and the individual alone as the source of all good and bad fortune. It equated wealth with divinity and poverty with sin. The eagle myth is also at the heart of our nation's booming secular religions, free market fundamentalism, consumerism, and self-improvement. To complete our transition from forager, farmer, smith, community member, and citizen to interchangeable labor input and consumer segment, we began a worship of the market's invisible hands. We lapped up sermons from free market fundamentalist clergy like Milton Friedman, Anne Rand, Ronald Reagan, and Friedrich Hayek, who grounded us in the moral license to dehumanize, exploit each other with increasingly abstract economic schemes. Over time, we built an economic ministry of control, dominance, and red tape, where roughly one half of the jobs and job responsibilities in our economy are what David Graeber's book, Bullshit Jobs, suggests are bullshit. These are jobs that have no economic or societal benefit, could disappear without anyone noticing, and are frequently physically, morally, psychologically, and spiritually damaging. These bullshit jobs and responsibilities empower us to dehumanize and control each other with bureaucracy, duct tape over our systemic failures, and elevate the image and prestige of those with slightly more status and power. We also created new bullshit products. We employed Edwin Bernays, Sigmund Freud's nephew, to help fools and their money part. Bernays translated the psychology of his uncle into irresistible subconscious advertising to manufacture the desire to fill our otherwise empty lives with goods and services that provide no discernible benefit. Legions of madmen followed him, convincing us that wealth, land, a big home, and the latest of everything were needed for us to survive, stand out, and have worth. According to this gospel of prosperity, markets self and self-improvement gurus like Norman Vincent Peale, Werner Earhart, Tony Robbins, Oprah Winfrey, and the madmen who dressed us for the occasion. We now had only one person to thank for anything good in our lives, and only one to blame for anything bad. Ourselves. If we didn't embody wealth, health, beauty, prestige, and boundless optimism, then it was presumed we had succumbed to the devil, limiting beliefs, or loserdom. The results are that we have become insecure and self-centered, plagued by what the Cree nation refers to as wetiko. That's W-E-T-I-K-O. An aggressive and parasitic selfishness. A study examining the evolution of language in the United States throughout the 1900s revealed that wor words such as thankfulness, kindness, appreciation, and helpfulness decreased by 56%. Additionally, the 2009, uh, a 2009 college, right, try that again. The average 2009 college student scored higher in narcissism on the narcissistic personality inventory than 65% of students in 1982, and 75% of college students in 2009 scored lower in empathy than the average student in 1979. Now, empowerment and achievement are not bad things at all. In a cohesive, intact, and just society, they are a great source of self-expression, individuation, actualization, and community wealth. However, empowerment and achievement in an eagle society, one increasingly devoid of social ties, moral instincts, ecological responsibility, and shared purpose, goes very wrong very quickly. For example, our two unhealed genocides, oligarchy, apartheid, subsistence wages, climate change, rape culture. One of the main problems of the eagle of the eagle mythos is that 
is the likelihood that it will actually bear any fruit. Although the media glamorizes the centralization of wealth, as marked by the meteoric rise of GDP, the Dow, the S&P 500, and the eagles who amass giant fortunes like Buffett, Musk, and Bezos, it is rarely questions, or it rarely questions why life is getting worse by the day. And we, as we explored in the last chapter, we've transferred 50 trillion from the bottom 90% to the top 1%, making it incredibly difficult for regular people to invest in themselves, their families, and their communities. For those of us who try to escape this scheme and become eagles ourselves by starting businesses, we must not only take a huge hit in pay, but go out of pocket for health care. And what is our reward for this sacrifice? 50% of us fail in the first five years, and 70% fail by year 10. Because we praise wealth and shame poverty, we blame the poor for their obvious lack of intelligence, creativity, and hard work. And when it is us on the ropes, we delude ourselves into thinking that with more hard work, soon our ship will come in. Or we turn to get rich, rich schemes like house flipping, crypto, MLMs, or crime, or we give up altogether and seek refuge in alcohol, drugs, video games, or conspiracy theories. As John Steinbeck once mused about why the labor movement had so much trouble gaining steam in the United States, quote, we didn't have any self-admitted proletarians. Everyone was a temporarily embarrassed capitalist. We don't need government handouts or solidarity with other oppressed peoples. We need more hard work and a little luck to acquire enough wealth to insulate ourselves from the market morality of the eagle. As we have explored, the suburbs contain a disproportionately white managerial class of people who own homes. They employ largely BIPOC, BIPOC working class people who predominantly pay rent in the cities and exurbs to largely white owners of rental properties. Those who live in the suburbs then commute to the cities where they make their income and enjoy entertainment, but generally do not pay any income or property tax. The result is that the suburbs have become eagles' nests, with well-maintained roads, well-funded schools and social services, smoothies, sushi, spas, gardeners, golf courses, and yoga studios. Starved of tax revenue, the exurbs and cities are, mar are marked by poverty, potholes, underfunded schools, food deserts, malnutrition, addiction, and obesity. Because the Eagles bootstraps and prosperity gospel has saturated every institution with which the poor engage, business, entertainment, religion, education, the necessary solidarity and political will required to change this arra arrangement never manifests. From scalps to slavery to sharecropping to Jim Crow, to lynching, to gated suburbs, to congested free freeways, to flat wages, to contract lending, to Hoover's counterintelligence program, to harass and, and assassinate civil rights and labor leaders, to pesticides, to consumerism, to forcing the global south, broadly, the regions of Latin America, Asia, Africa, and Oceania, to take on uh, expensive debt from the IMF and World Bank to to housing projects, to toxic waste, waste dumps, to poisoned air and water, to privatized health care, to union busting, to rape culture, to CIA coups. 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 <laughs> it's almost as if hurt people can't do anything else but devise new ways to make a buck by exploiting others. Eagle's gonna eagle. There are so many wonderful things to celebrate our country, about our country from our democratic institutions, to music, to crafts, to technology, to universities, to arts, to national parks, to our scientific achievements. However, these things exist in large part because we have taken from, oppressed, and exterminated others, nearly exclusively without remorse or repair. In the same way, the gilded palace halls of Buckingham and Versailles are truly extraordinary yet also dirty with the blood of murder, slavery, torture, rape, and oppression. Much of what is good, true, and beautiful in our, in our society was built on the backs of those we enslaved, oppressed, and exterminated. 
Knowing the truth about our history would not bother us if we took pride in being a bunch of shifty eagles. These truths only bother us because deep down we know we are not. We know we are, the, we are better than the murdering, thieving, raping, and enslaving of our ancestors. If we didn't hold ourselves to a higher standard, if we didn't have a powerful national purpose, reading this, or in your case listening to it, would produce no resistance, no knot in the pit of our stomachs. If this makes you feel bad about our country, you are not alone. When I started to engage with this history, I was enraged. Two business degrees, $200,000 in student loans, for what? To build myself a life raft while everything I hold sacred drowns? Feeling sadness, shame, and anger is not bad. It's natural in the face of being miseducated and betrayed. It's healthy to feel remorse anger and shame when we acknowledge that we and our ancestors have been complicit in hurting others let us remember the suffering our ancestors caused the danger of perpetuating it through inaction and the redemption and renewal available to us through reckoning responsibility and repair let us use this moment to guide us back into our ideals and purpose let us end our toxic relationship with the eagle Complete this chapter of U.S. history and start a new one. R.I.P. Eagle, 27 B.C.E. to 2022 C.E. Sorbet. With these hard truths out of the way, I, I again invite you to cleanse your palate. Do what you need to do to shake it off. Perhaps a walk around the block, a good cry, or a hug might serve you. Let us now articulate a new era of collective flourishing, healing, belonging, and purpose. One that calls forth our moral instincts, our most cherished ideals. One that effectuates Dr. King's dream of beloved community. What myth might call us into our, na into our nation's powerful purpose? In a time when culture and politics have devolved into game warfare, where even our flag and our colors are polarizing, our country needs a new unifying myth to guide us into a future of collective flourishing. As the fates would have it, this symbol arrived under auspicious skies and with bipartisan support. This is from Fred Dubray, Cheyenne River Sioux. Quote, we recognize the bison as a symbol of strength and unity." End quote. In 2016, as a result of a bipartisan coalition in the House and Senate, along with the Intertribal Bu Buffalo Council and the Na National Bison Association, the bison became our national mammal. But it is much more than that. It is a symbol of strength, redemption, protection, resilience, care, courage, and our Commonwealth from the National Park Service. Quote, After four years of outreach to Congress and the White House by the Wildlife Conservation Society, its partners, the Intertribal Buffalo Council, and the National Bison Association, and 60-plus vote bison coalition members, the National Bison Legacy Act was signed on May 9, 2016, officially making the bison our national mammal. This historic event represents a true comeback story, embedded with the history, culture, and conservation. To honor such an iconic and resilient species, Congress passed the National Bison Legacy Act on April 28, 2016, making the bison a U.S. symbol of unity, resilience, and healthy landscapes and communities. The act recognizes the historical, cultural, and economic importance of the bison. More than 60 American Indian tribes participate in the Intertribal Buffalo Council, an organization working to help coordinate and assist tribes in returning bison back to tribal lands. Also, over one million acres of tribal land contribute to the conservation and cultural efforts of the bison. Not only do bison play an important cultural role, 
they also have significant economic value. Private bison producers own about 360,000 bison, creating jobs and providing healthy meat, a healthy meat source as well as leather and wool products to the American public. Bison also play an important ecological role, beneficially influencing prairie ecosystems through their grazing patterns and behavior. Although the recognition does not convey new protections for the bison, the Act recognizes the great conservation success story and importance of its comeback to Native Americans and rural communities alike. This new and permanent designation conveys a vision of shared values, of unity, resilience, and healthy landscapes and communities. No other species is so iconic of American history and culture like the bison. The Bison Way The myth of the bison elicits something deep in our souls. It connects us to rolling prairies and lush forests, rushing rivers, majestic peaks, the rising sun, a prismatic dusk, and a starry sky. It connects us into individual and collective power. It calls us into relationship with wild nature, play, community, and adventure. It beckons us to be grateful for natural beauty and summons us to care for all that is sacred. It also comes with its own operating system, a new set of national ethics, far different than those of the bald eagle. So there's eight of them, and I'm going to detail them here. Courage. Unlike cattle, bison run straight into an approaching storm to move through it quickly. An apt metaphor for the hard truths we must face as a nation and the necessary reforms we must implement to address polarization, racial justice, rape culture, climate change, and income inequality. Care. Bison care for the most vulnerable by placing them, by placing them in the center of the herd. An equally apt metaphor for the way we must holistically care for our sick, depressed, traumatized, young, elderly, disabled, and historically excluded. Or marginalized. Inclusion. Bison make room for other species to graze, drink, and play, sharing close space with elk, moose, deer, and winged ones. Another metaphor for the diverse relationships we are summoned to develop in our economy, communities, ecologies, and foreign policy. Play. Bison spend a good deal of time at play with each other, laying about, nudging each other, and running off together. Independence. Bison make room for themselves. Although they move about as herds, they can often be found wandering alone, as if solitude, leisure, and discovery were all that mattered. Generativity. Through their play, wallowing, grazing, bison till the soil, protect fresh water springs, and play a vital role in the ecological resilience of their habitats, cultivating the diversity of plant, insect, and bird populations. Bison are a symbol of genuine prosperity for many First Nations, a symbol of giveaway, of purpose, of contributing their 100 gifts towards the betterment of all. Protection. Bison are ornery if provoked. They are fiercely protective of themselves and their community, leveraging their incredible strength, acceleration, and speed, up to 40 miles an hour, to ward off threats and gore if necessary. Another apt metaphor for the spirit we must bring to tending to the social, emotional, and environmental health of our people and communities, as well as the power and responsibility organizations have to protect and heal the nation. Redemption. To clear the West for farming and, and railroads, the bison were nearly exterminated. Because of their majesty, their ascetic and moral value, and the critical role they play in many ecosystems, we have chosen to bring them back, to make room for them to thrive, and allow them to guide us into a deeper expression of who we are. So what does this mean for us? 
It means that we can allow the mythos of the, bi of the bison to work on us individually, to move through us into greater courage, care, inclusion, play, independence, protection, generativity, and redemption. This set of ethics is neither liberal or conservative, but rather evokes the fullest expression of both attitudes. Within these ethics, we find greater compassion and power, greater equity and individual achievement, greater connection and courage. It means we, re we remember who we are deep down, who we once were as children, foragers, and simple farmers. Before the eagle broke us, forced us to work ourselves to the bone, turn on each other and surrender our hearts, bodies, mutual concern, rituals, coherent cosmologies, rich languages, and inspired ethics. This doesn't mean abdicating our will or purpose, what makes us unique or necessitate that we become pagans or socialists, but rather remembering that as we bring forth our gifts, we acknowledge that we too are mammals who are fundamentally intuitive, relational, and responsive. We are of, by, and for the earth and each other. It means we remember that we're imbued with voice, emotions, and neurochemicals that bind us to one another. We have evolved with empathy and altruism, not pure selfishness, to survive. We are wired to care, connect, feel, communicate, play, relate, and cooperate. As we begin the era of the bison, we cannot simply say the past is the past and wipe the slate clean and just begin anew. That has never worked. People remember. People carry the wounds and injustices of the past into the present via their neighborhoods, the epigenetic expressions of trauma, oral histories, dysfunctional family dynamics, cemeteries, unmarked and mass graves, and the eagle's institutional norms that still perpetuate harm. Reckoning and repair are required if we are to be redeemed and renewed. As William Faulkner said, quote, the past is never dead. It's not even the past, end quote. It's time to accept that we are all in recovery, in a post-traumatic response to centuries of dehumanization and oppression extending back to at least the Roman Empire. What many of us consider to be our personalities and careers and culture are really coping mechanisms we've developed to endure centuries of trauma in order to survive. As a result, we're all in varying stages of grief, healing, and recovery. To heal from our multiple traumas and enter a period of post-traumatic growth, we must turn towards one another as bison do, as we did during the abolition, labor, suffrage, and civil rights movements, to sing, grieve, lament, heal, create, and rejoice. So what does this mean for you as a leader? It means we must guide our organizations towards greater connection to and care for the Commonwealth. It means we must view the world and each business decision through the lens of resilience and long-term wealth of the bison versus extraction and the short-term profits of the eel. It means we must also be vigilant for the remnants of the eagle mythos still preying on our thinking, our marriages, families, and neighborhoods as we develop new ways to communicate, connect, lead, and do business. To do so means we transform our approach to our people, culture, and learning. We no longer view people as an expense to be reduced, but rather as a source of long-term wealth, resilience, and innovation. It, it means we move labor from a line item expense on the income statement, from something to be minimized in service of shareholder profit, to an asset on our balance sheets, something to be invested in, cultivated, and protected. We no longer abdicate our responsibility for culture and well-being, but intentionally develop it. It means that we view each person as whole, with emotions, a soul, trauma, a life outside of work, family responsibilities, and a community. All of these need tending. 
It means we see each person as worthy of dignity and prosperity, that we bless the beauty of each soul, empower each person to develop a connection to their purpose, and the opportunity to shape their lives and careers in its image. It means that we find our unique connection to our organization's mission and values. It means we take a stand on the pressing issues in our society and environment and err on the side of making mistakes in service of the bison ethos. It means we are bold, vocal, and hold ourselves accountable to our purpose and values by treating each other with dignity as B Corps do and having fun as the main beer company articulates by following its purpose, quote, do the right thing, quote, main beer company strives to hire a talented, thoughtful, and diverse workforce. That contributes to the overall culture of the company. Main beer offers all full-time employees 100% employer paid health insurance, at least three weeks paid time off, paid holidays, 401k safe harbor contributions, and profit sharing, referral bonuses, dental insurance, parental leave, and employee assistance programs. And don't forget about the free beer. End quote. It means we are deliberately developmental, seeking to unlock and activate human potential within and outside of our organization. It means we bring care to each phase of the employee life cycle, from candidate to new hire to leader to alumni. It means we stop applying the Eagles' paternalistic approach to people where we view them as selfish actors who need to be reformed and assimilated and motivated with compliance, incentives, and punishments. It means we move from a talent ethos of culture fit towards celebrating our uniqueness as a culture ad. It means we adopt the ethos of healing, empowerment, and connection bringing people together to learn about themselves and each other in a safe and effective way. It means we end our reliance on one-time compliance trainings and build a culture through ongoing immersive social learning experiences, where learning and authentic connection are part of the normal course of business. It means we stop our extractive and oppressive business practices and look to regenerative, cradle-to-cradle approaches to meet customer needs. This might sound nice and all, but at least some part of you might be thinking, if you tell your investors or board you're doing this, they'll fire you on the spot. You'll ruin your reputation, lose your house, and hurt your family. Luckily, you have more than the people, history, your moral instincts, and the iconic archetype of the bison on your side. You also have powerful data to build buy-in. It is perhaps a great irony that there is a more compelling business case for activating bison ethics than the extractive status quo of the eagle. But it is so. Applying the bison ethos and activating purpose and belonging, you can expect to realize more than $20,000 per employee per year in additional productivity and an additional 7.4 months in average tenure. Given that the average tenure of an employee is about four years, that's an expected gain of $80,000 per employee. Let's say you hire coaches for each one of your employees at $6,000 a year. That's a 3.3 return, 3.3x return. Let's say you activate purpose and belonging with small diverse peer groups at $500 a year. That's a 40x return. This is obviously not an iterative improvement, but rather a step function change in collective flourishing. It's the realization of Heather McGee's solidarity dividend. Additionally, productivity and tenure aren't all you will improve by activating purpose and belonging. If you decide to take this path, it will benefit all of your key stakeholders, your investors, customers, and employees. For example, investors. Stakeholder-driven companies outperform the S&P by 100%. Purpose-driven companies posted a 9.5% Uh, average compounded annual growth rate versus the 2.4% of the S&P consumer sector. That's like basically 4x. And purpose-driven companies outperform their peers by 12 to 1. Now customers, 
global consumers are four to six times more likely to trust, buy from, champion, and protect companies that lead with purpose. Six of every 10 consumers and nine of every 10 millennials say they will buy from a company that leads with purpose. 87% of global consumers believe businesses should put at least as much emphasis on social interests as business ones. Gen Z consumers are 85% more likely to trust a brand, 84% more likely to buy their products, 82% more likely to recommend that brand to their friends and family if a brand supports a cause. And six of every 10 Americans would choose, switch, avoid, or boycott a brand based on its societal issues compared to five of 10 folks in 2017. Now let's get to our number one stakeholder, employees. That's from the Edelman Trust Barometer in 2021. Purpose-driven employees are 175% more productive. Purpose is correlated with a 333% increase in organizational commitment. 90% of, <clears throat> of global employees in purpose-driven companies are engaged versus 20% of the global workforce Purpose-driven leaders have employees who are 70% more satisfied, 56% more engaged, and 100% more likely to stay at your organization. By activating the myth of the bison, we deliver for our employees, customers, communities, shareholders, nation, and ecosystems. We also engage in a new covenant, a new shared identity that helps us redeem the sins of our ancestors putting meat on the bones of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all, and transmuting pluribus into unum. In the next chapter, Culture Change is a Matter of Life and Death, we'll explore what is at stake in activating this shift towards the bison. So the chapter two summary. Every nation has a myth that governs their actions towards each other, the earth, and other nations. The same is true for organizations. We have been shaped by the myth of the eagle, a parasitic individualism that has resulted in slavery, genocide, and apartheid, climate change, rape culture, and a $50 trillion wealth transfer to the 1%. We have an opportunity to adopt a new myth, the way of the bison, to reckon with our past, accept responsibility, prepare, repair the damage caused, and be redeemed and renewed. By most measures, bison-led companies significantly, significantly outperform those that do not. So the reflection questions for you and your book buddy or your book club. Where in your life are you guided by the eagle? In your health, romance, family work, community, where you choose to live, finances, spirituality? Where in your life do you feel the ethics of the bison present? What would it be like to work in your organization if it was guided by the bison? What would your community be like if the 20 largest employers in your area were also guided by the bison? That concludes chapter two, folks. Stay tuned for chapter three, uh, looking at the stakes of culture. Uh, and of course, if you want to engage more deeply, resources in the description here, uh, you know where to find me. Wish you well. See you next time.